So perioral dermatitis is uh, a f best categorized as a form of rosacea that typically affects young women. Um, uh, and a, you usually get a rash, sometimes it's red bump, sometimes it's scaly rash, around the openings on the face. Often around, it's called perioral because it's usually around the mouth, but it can be around the nose or around the eyes. And, uh, and it can go to other parts of the body, other parts of the face as well, but it usually starts there. And, uh, and often if, if you think of it as, if you recognize it as a f what it is, which is a form of rosacea, then you can, the doctor can put you in the direction of the right treatments. But if you misdiagnose this as a dermatitis as opposed to rosacea, then you go down the primrose path where you get, you're giving topical steroids, which actually initially help, but then perpetuate the condition and make it worse. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, you know, it be, you put it on, it gets better, and then you get worse. And mm -hmm. you put more on, and it gets worse. You know, mm -hmm. it gets better, and it gets worse. And it becomes a, 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 a perpetual situation. Yeah, that because because I in my own research and talking to derms, you're the first one I've heard say it's like a cousin of rosacea. Because some people say it's more eczema-like, some people describe it as like eczema meets acne. It's just it's a very confusing condition because there's not even really a I guess a widely accepted definition. Well, the the, the, re, the, the there's two good reasons to um, give something a diagnosis in all of medicine. Mm -hmm. The first is you can tell people the prognosis. You say you have you have perioral dermatitis, this is what's going to happen to you. And the second is it helps you think about certain treatments. So if you think about it like rosacea, then you think about treatments that are often used for rosacea, which generally work for perioral dermatitis. If you think of that as eczema, then you go down the wrong path. And you start, then the treatments that you might prescribe actually could do more harm than good. So that's the value of kind of linking it to rosacea is that it helps you get a mindset of how you might want to approach it and what you can tell people. Well, it's confusing too because some people link rosacea to eczema. Like some people have both. Yeah, some people do have both. Like I feel like it's very common yeah. for someone to have both. Well, they're both common conditions yeah. and, um, and so common things sometimes uh, occur. But usually rosacea, not always, occurs a little bit later in life and perioral dermatitis is typically in young women. It's, yeah. you know, it's a classic uh, um, group that gets it. Well, a lot of times when people first get it, they think it's just like minor pimples or they're yeah. breaking yes. out, right? Right. And so then they treat it like acne. Right. So then it doesn't go away because they're treating it like something it's not. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, it can. Be, it can because sometimes you never treat it. So I'm, I'm in multiple Facebook support groups. There's like a yes. few thousand in each, people from all over the world, and we've all shared pictures and what we use, right. what works, what doesn't work. It's very confusing because everyone's looks so different. Like mine, when you saw it at, at its worst, yeah. like mine looked very acne-like. Yes. But the difference between that and acne, like it wasn't like poppable zits. Like, you know, people like to pop yeah. their zits. I yeah. wouldn't know because I never had zits, but like I've yeah. heard. Um, so I'd like try to pop them and it wouldn't really pop. So why is it that some people's look so different than others? Yeah, so it's just, a, it's a, there's a wide spectrum of this disease. And it, like there's a wide spectrum of rosacea. So rosacea has different presentations, perioral dermatitis. Some people have redness, some people have bumps, some people blood vessels, some people even have pustules that you can pop. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a spectrum of presentations. But what's really challenging about these support groups is you experienced it. You went to California and you got better. And you're not really sure why you got better. It could have been the cream that, and you may recommend, oh I was using Cream X and you may tell your group, but it may have nothing to do with that. It could have been less stress, it could have been the environment, less humidity, it could have been a, a lot of different things that might have contributed to get, getting better, but if you attributed it to the celery solution, uh, and you'd be telling everybody celery solution worked, right. and, and you don't really know and uh, what you know what happened. But for you personally, the important thing is that you did get better. Right. I mean, you, you're dramatically better than you were. You're not where you're going to be. You're not where you want to be, mm -hmm. but but dramatically better. So when someone does have perioral dermatitis, what is like their first response and treatment? So. Uh, the first response and treatment is I usually use a tetracycline uh, derivative. I like minocycline, but you can use doxycycline or perioral tetracycline. And many people, if you catch it early and you explain the things you shouldn't, 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 shouldn't do, mm -hmm. then they often do quite well. Okay. Uh, uh, then we, you know we may add some topicals, like some of the things we've had, not topical steroids, but 
Metro Nine is all Metro Queen, things of that nature. And that um, usually, those yeah. just the combination of that usually works for a lot of people. For most people, for most people. More recently, people have been using this ivermectin cream, the cilantro you had, yeah. and that's, you know, people, you know, say that's terrific. But the truth is, is that while in some people it can work very quickly, you know, some other people it takes a while. And when you lose confidence in the healthcare system, you know, all, you, you know it empowers people to, to, to not, you know, to not... To try things on their yeah, own. Yeah, exactly. Because you say, well, I tried it for a week, it's not long enough. But, you know, it's... It's like if you got on the airplane to fly from Sacramento to Miami and after an hour you say, where are we? Well, we're never gonna get there, I'm going home. And you never complete the, 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 flight. the flight, yeah. Well, also too, I've realized, is a lot of people feel like skin issues like eczema, rosacea, perineal dermatitis, acne, are linked to your diet and your yes. gut. Um, but I feel like if you talk to a lot of doctors, like they don't really talk about that. Right. And I think the complaint that many people have is doctors whether it's a dermatologist or primary care, they tend to treat the symptoms and not the root cause. Yeah. So what, what, are, what is your take on that? I think that w when we become smart enough to know, I think probably we'll find out that many skin conditions are related to diet and the microbiome of your stomach. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that you, even if you think that's the case now, it's hard to know what to do about it. You know, we don't know how to treat it, we could say, yogurt or change your diet. People said cut out dairy, so yeah. then I can't eat yogurt. Yeah, so we don't know. That's what, that's the whole point, is that while we, we think that there's something going on in the GI tract that may cause inflammatory skin diseases, and there's some data for some skin diseases, we don't know what to do with it. Someday we will, mm -hmm. but right now we don't, and so doctors generally want to be proactive. They want to have a solution for somebody, and so they use the solutions they're familiar with because the, the new ideas, which may be right, we don't have good solutions yet. Okay. So you acknowledge that more research needs to be done linking diet and gut health to skin. It just, the research isn't there yet. It's not there yet. And, it's, and, and, and I'm, if I had a bet, I would bet that we're going to find a lot of skin diseases that are related to um, you know, the, the microbiome of our stomach. Right. Because some people are saying, like, I went vegan and my skin cleared up. Other people are like, I only ate meat and my skin cleared up. Right. Like you said, some people recommend like probiotics, like 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 yogurt right. or fermented like kimchi. People were telling me to eat, right. but then other people are like, no, cut out dairy. Dairy is known to make women break out. It's just like you said, there's this distrust I think of the medical care system and the pharmaceutical industry. People right. don't want to take antibiotics or pills or use anything prescribed, and and I can see why. But yet, when they go on the internet or they chatter with other people, then it causes more confusion almost. Yeah. Did you hear this? Uh, it was in the news about a few weeks ago about this fellow who took antibiotics and it changed his microbiome with his stomach. And he, grew, he started to grow a yeast. That's the yeast that's, that's used in making beer. And every time he would drink, uh, eat uh, carbohydrates, pizza and things like that, he started, started fermenting the carbohydrates, the sugars, into ethanol, and he would get drunk. I read, this was not a few weeks, this was a while ago. Yeah, no. well, there, well, there there have been a few cases, but oh. there was a recent one again published and got into international media a few weeks ago. So maybe, yeah. So it's called auto brewery syndrome, and it has to do with uh, the, somebody got antibiotics and it changed their GI microbiome, oh. and they gave this fella an anti yeast pill, and he was cured. But somebody had to be smart enough to think that maybe something is going on, and he's not just lying that he's drinking or whatever. So okay, perial dermatitis. Yeah. Would you consider it? What would you call it? A skin disease, a skin condition. Like, what would you call it? Yeah, I would probably call it a skin disease. Okay. Which and you group it with like. I would say I, I most comfortably group it in in with rosacea. However, it affects a slightly different population. The presentation is somewhat different. So while, you know, we kind of put it in that category so we could think about it in a certain way with regard to treatment, it is a distinct entity. And it's something I feel like a lot of people don't know about until they're diagnosed with it. Like, yeah. everyone knows what acne looks like, right? If you're suffering a breakout, you think you have acne. Eczema is well known, although lesser known than acne. And then rosacea is kind of up there with eczema. Well known, but not as much as acne. Right. Why is this condition so not talked about and so little is known about it? Yeah, because I think that, um, as you experienced, when, you, when you, you broke out and your first initial thing was to hide it. And it only took you a long time, even though you're in the public face, to finally kind of tell people about it. 
So it's relatively uncommon, not rare, but relatively uncommon, not less common as acne, which affects almost everybody. Mm -hmm. And it affects people's appearance, and they don't really, you know, people don't want to talk about it. They rather hide it. They put mm -hmm. makeup on, and they try to do a thousand different treatments before they kind of tell people about it. So it's, it's not, you know, what people generally talk about in dinner conversation or cocktail parties. Right, and I feel like some people maybe have it for, like, quickly, and they think it's acne, and then they, they treat it as such, or maybe it goes away on its right. own, and it went away with the entire time them thinking they had an acne right. flare-up. Right, right, like, so they may not even know they ever had it. So would you say, would you agree that it's more common than people might think? Oh, yes. So it's it's not as common as acne, which affects everybody, but we but if dermatologists see it routinely, that's why when you start to go to reputable dermatologists, they recognize it right away. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I feel like, don't. They, they may get, get a breakout, but not go to a dermatologist. Right, They'll right. just deal with it on their own. Yeah, yeah. And then also, too, I want to talk about, um, so I've read in my research, WebMD and, like, you know, different websites, that um, the exact cause isn't known, but the more common causes are overuse or misuse or whatever of steroid creams, um, steroids like nasal sprays or, or oral sprays, um, and um, fluoride toothpaste. Is one I read. Are, is that accurate? The more common cause. Yeah. So, so one of the there, there's so yeah. So by far, I think most people link it to steroid usage of some sort, often topical steroids. But the clinical presentation, including your clinical presentation, looked very much like a condition called uh, halogenoderma. And halogenoderma is when people are exposed to certain chemicals, halogens, fluorides and halogens, bromides are halogens. Mm -hmm. And you get this very kind of um, uh, almost warty appearance, like at one point your your your, ch your chin was, it kind of had this uh, almost like a you know, raspberry look to it. Uh, That's a very nice way of describing <laughs> yeah. it. I wouldn't think about raspberries, right. but yeah. yeah. So it had this appearance. So, so that's why I think the appearance of uh, this periodontal dermatitis can look very much like a halogenoderma. Got it. And uh, so, yeah. And some people think that there, there's this caused by allergists, hormones, stress, climate. Yeah. Or could those also be factors or causes? They can. And uh, and the truth is, we uh, uh, we don't know what we don't know all the causes. Again, it could be the GI microbiome. It could be things we don't even think about. But people, when they have something, they like to uh, attribute causality. You know. Because they, they don't want it to happen again. Right. They right, want to right. say, well, you know, it's like somebody, you know, somebody says, well, you know, I, it's caused because I drink, and if I, if I ever stop drinking, it can go away. Mm -hmm. But because they want to have control over their disease, so that they, you know, if you if you can uh, find out something that attributed to some cause, then in theory, even if you don't control it, you you know that you could. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is there's so much to be learned about this condition um, that we don't know a lot, and we don't know all what always causes it. Yeah. In your case, it seemed to be quite te quite linked to the use of the topical steroids, right. but everybody's not as clear as you. Well, then I also want to talk about the emotional impact. You know, I know that you're a skin disease dermatologist, that's your specialty, but you see people, I'm sure, with like skin cancer and other more serious skin diseases. But from my experience and talking with people who have gone through this, and I feel like I'm a pretty confident person. I'm very secure in who I am. I hate wearing makeup. I'm out and about. Like, I will not be dressed up. Like, I don't care, right? It's, except for, like, obviously on TV. Like, yeah. then I get done up. But other than that, like, I'm very, like, I dress like a college student going to class. Right. Um, but I've seen how it's emotionally affected a lot of people. People who've quit their jobs. People who refuse to, like, take their kids or go to anything of their kids' events. They don't, they don't want to do anything public. But then there's also this added layer of guilt, right? People who feel guilty for being so upset. They know they could have skin cancer or another type of cancer or have more serious medical conditions. As someone who's seen a lot of patients, I'm sure with, with more serious and, and lesser serious skin conditions, can you talk a little bit about the emotional impact that having like a blemish or rosacea or eczema or acne can, can cause on someone? Yeah, skin disease has a dramatic impact on people's quality of life, dramatic. And the reason is, is that if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, you could be sitting next to somebody and they'll never know it. But if you have a skin condition, especially one that's on your face or some invisible area, everybody knows. So it really affects your self-esteem, and that when it affects your self-esteem, it can reduce your quality of life, cause depression, 
and then it becomes a, a, a circular phenomenon that you you feel bad, you don't want to go out, then you feel bad because you're not going out, and then so it really can dramatically affect people. On the other hand, when they get better, you dermatologists can have a dramatic in, impact on improving patients' mm -hmm. self-esteem and how they feel and improve their depression because of, of, uh, of treating their skin disease. So for a dermatologist, it's quite rewarding to treat mm -hmm. people because, you know, they, even though they, you may not die from perioral dermatitis, but once you get to back to where you're going to be, you're going to be that happy-go-lucky, carefree person again, and that's very rewarding for a doctor. Oh, 